So, this is a panel about people using Rust in production. Uh, on one side, we have Jeremy. You have heard about him and Apollo GraphQL for the past 40 minutes, more or less. So, I assume you're all introduced with Jeremy. On the other side, we have Bastian, uh, which you might have seen in the audience, but probably haven't heard of. So, let's start from you. Who are you? Why are you here? What are you telling us tonight? All right. Uh, well, first of all, nice to meet you all. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, Sebastian, uh, I'm the co-founder of Rayon. We're a startup doing a collaborative design tool for architecture and interior design. So basically Figma for architecture, you'd say. And we do use Rust a lot for the core engine of the app. So it's pretty much like a game engine that we use to render and to do all the computation for geometry. Uh, so that's basically what I do. And about me a bit. Just to say that I have kind of an odd career because even though I have an engineering background, I didn't do much computer science at school at all. It was pretty much pen and paper at the time. And then I became a civil servant and I worked in public housing for 10 years. So I pretty much self-taught in computer science, which is kind of a testament that you can actually learn uh, Rust late in your career. So don't hesitate to do that. And then I co-founded a first startup and I started to learn about tech. And I did this for five years before I co-founded Rayon. Perfect. So we've heard before from Jeremy how the Rust parties meetup in a way was his gateway into open source and also his gateway into Rust specifically. What was your journey to Rust? Yeah, sure. So as I said, I, I, I kind of started to teach myself coding in 2015, somewhere around that. Started with JavaScript, classical, uh, Node.js, doing web apps, stuff like that. Uh, and then I moved a bit into data science, especially computational geometry, and we were doing a lot of Python, and a bit also of .NET C Sharp, because a lot of the SDKs in the field of CAD is done in .NET. And at that point, you know, Python was sometimes slow. So that then a lot of Python know that. And usually the case is you rewrite a bunch of code in C and then use that in your Python code. I didn't want to do much C, so I started to look at Rust. And that was my first experience. And fortunately at the time we were doing quite complex algorithm in geometry and they often involve data structures such as D cell, double connected edge list or a half edge, which you might know is not the easier structure to do in Rust if you're a beginner. So I tried that and I was, okay, what is this? I have to use ref cell, interior mutability, unwrap all the time. It really, really sucks. I was like, and, and then I ran it. Of course, I didn't use the release flag and I was like, ah, oh, it's slow, it's bad. So I kind of gave up on it. But then I was you know, starting to think about Rayon and doing basically a vector graphic tools, very similar to Figma. And I was like, oh, okay, so how do you build this? I, I had no idea how you can build something like that. And the first thing, of course, you need to do is build your own renderer because Canvas or SVG is not going to cut it if you have huge models. And in computer graphics, C++ is kind of the king language. And all the libraries are in C++. Most of the legacy tools are in C++. But at that time, it was around, I think, 2016, uh, 2017, there was a huge like traction and Rust, and people were rewriting stuff from C++ to Rust. And I kind of stumbled upon a crate, which was called Pathfinder from Patrick Walton, you might know it, which was amazing. It was a tile-based rendering engine. And I was like, oh, I got to learn Rust to understand this. So that's kind of how I became interested in Rust. Then I saw the Lion crate from Nicola Silva as well, super interesting. Then all the work from Ralph Leven in PHGPU, so I was like, okay, this is it. I'm going to write it in Rust. So that's how I started in Rust. I see. So one methodology note before I keep going for questions. That's still the QR code for the Slido. So if you want to ask questions, that's the preferred way. We're also going to take questions from the audience. If you prefer, just raise your hand. I'll see you. And then I'll send Marco with the mic at the right moment. Said that. So we heard before about Apollo and we heard about, you know, we use Rust because we are deploying a gazillion servers and, you know, it makes sense to use something faster because we save on infrastructure and reliability and so on and so forth. What about Rayon? So you spoke about rendering. Why has that led you to Rust? And so it's a very good question. And I think it was some kind of a you know, topic that was debated, like, you know, using Rust 
to basically compile it to WASM and to run, use that in the browser, there was a question, is this actually faster than well-crafted JavaScript? And it's a good question. It's not an easy answer, to be honest. A lot of people that have done benchmark can see that sometimes you can get the same performance if you write very well JavaScript. And I remember, especially there were like a, a blog post, it was about, should you rewrite on WASM? And it was, I don't remember the guy name, it was a very smart guy that basically took a library written in WASM and just rewrote it in JavaScript by using super smart you know, ideas and it was as fast. But the takeaway I got from that was you should absolutely use WASM because it was insane the level of expertise this guy had. He knew everything about V8, about SpiderMonkey. He knew you know, it was complete incredible hacks to get you know, the runtime in the browser to go very fast. Compare this to WASM, uh, you get a very consistent performance across different devices and also you get all the advantages of Rust language. So I thought about it and I realized that to build a very performant design tool, probably going the WASM route was a good idea. And now I, I, I don't regret it. I think it was a, it's a good choice. So basically you're saying that you can use JavaScript as the assembly of V8 and you can manage to get any performance, but it's actually much easier to get that out if you use WASM. Yeah, exactly. I think the, the main point is if you're doing a design tool that is supposed to draw very large models, they're going to be made up of very small entities uh, in very large number. And this is something that JavaScript does very badly. Uh, so because you get all those objects, they're very heavy in memory. So you need to use type to raise and you need to destruct everything. Uh, so it becomes really hard to do. Uh, and contrast that with Rust. You get abstraction for free. You get control over the memory layouts. Uh, and you can just you know do it uh, much simpler in a way. So that's one of the reasons I think it's quite important. And Figma had done a kind of a debrief because at the beginning, Figma, they were using C++, but they were using SAMGS. So they actually lived the transition to WASM and they brought that they gained like two to three times in performance in CPU speed, which was quite impressive. So that was another argument that kind of convinced me to use it. Okay, that makes sense. Let's take this a step farther, right? So very often we speak about Rust as if Rust it's a thing, like a monolithic concept. But in reality, when you speak about Rust, you speak about Rust, the language, and Rust, the ecosystem. And depending on the use case, the ecosystem is more or less mature, more or less stable, more or less comprehensive, so to say. So let's go back to Jeremy, who's been sitting here very patiently. How was your experience at Apollo rewriting the router when it comes to the ecosystem. And the question specifically is about how much did you find that you could pick off the shelf and mostly worked compared to having to customize or having to write your own things or just becoming an expert of every single open source library that you were deploying. It's just an experience I personally had in the past. Yeah, <laughs> I feel you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, um, The way I behave um, at home or on site projects and the way I behave at Apollo are drastically different. When I'm on site projects, I basically go to are we da 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 yet dot com. So are we web yet? And then I pick whatever is popular or looks fancy or is interesting. And, uh, and then I start doing stuff. Uh, when you're working, for example, at Apollo, we actually package that stuff. There are people who actually rely on our stuff. We can't just ship random stuff and expect people to use it or live with all the quirks and bugs that could be found. So it's not the, it's not the same mindset at all. That being said, there's like, what we build is pretty much an HTTP proxy that you can use in your infrastructure. There are HTTP bits on which I think the ecosystem is extremely mature. And there, there's then a GraphQL awareness layer, which is the one that we bring into the table so this raises a lot of interesting questions by the way like build versus buy uh, what is my domain what is it that i'm working on i'm working on graphql i'm not working on http per se http stuff i'm going to use hyper i'm going to use what was it that we used before warp and then we switched to axum because there's this tower rs ecosystem of uh, composable services reusable services we're going to be on top of that no questions asked everyone's using it we're going to use it Tokyo, should I use Tokyo? Hmm. 
there are other runtimes, right? I really enjoyed other runtimes. I enjoyed them in my side projects, unfortunately, because most of the ecosystem relies on Tokyo. I'm not going to take any chances, any chances as to my supply chain or my ability to move fast later. So yeah, most of the time, it's either us reusing libraries that are widely adopted and that we are fortunate enough to, to understand because we've used them in the past. I'm thinking of the Fred for Redis, for example, the Fred client. Tower, tracing, tracing, open telemetry, my God. It's really great. Uh, it's hard to get right, but it's there. Everyone is using it. Everyone is relying heavily on open telemetry. We're going to use open telemetry. No questions asked. That's, that's pretty much the rationale or the decision. Can we be there for our customers if we use this tool? See. So basically the message, the message I'm getting is you only use old improved technology at work and then you run zigs on the edge with SQLite replicated for fun. Yeah, pretty <laughs> that, much. That's pretty much pretty the decolonization. Cross compilation okay. with dig is awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> So let's move to Bastion instead, because obviously you have a very different domain, right? So on this side, we're looking at HTTP proxying uh, with some level of GraphQL magic on top. On this other side, we're looking at rendering engines and multiplayer experiences in the browser. How is the ecosystem for that in Rust? So, so I would say that it's, it's getting better a lot, uh, but it's not you know, the same as C++. So you do get that trade-off. If you would write a rendering engine in C++, you would get a lot of things that you don't get in Rust. So yeah, I would say it's not that great, uh, but it's still very good. And also the community is amazing and you get cargo, so you get you know, way better management of your dependencies. So we do, I mean, in our case, that's kind of a core business. So we are okay with writing stuff from scratch. We are okay writing our own renderer. Uh, we do use some libraries. Uh, for example, the whole engine is based on an ECS, so Entity Component System, and we use a library for that. We didn't build our own ECS. Um, but I feel sometimes you know, the move we do is we start with an open source project, and very rapidly, due to performance and domain constraints, we might move it then, we might fork it and make it our own. Uh, we did this, for example, for spatial data structure. We use acceleration through quad trees, or in this case, an R star tree, which is a kind of data structure that we use for that. And initially, we used a library for that, but then in the end, we wrote our own. Uh, but it's very useful to get that you know, little push at the beginning, and then you can understand better and you can improve. So I, I would definitely say that the, the ecosystem is not as great as other languages, for sure, but it's still very good. And uh, I think you should choose Rust for stuff that is very business, you know, uh, centric in our case, so it doesn't really matter that much. Okay, that makes sense. Let me ask you a follow-up question because you touched on ECS uh, systems. How much of, because obviously there's the graphic rendering community and then there's the gaming game development community in Rust, how much of this ecosystem actually overlap and you're able to reuse or are you a little bit on two different points of the spectrum and the requirements are two different? So, so there's definitely an overlap here. Uh, and it's true that the gaming community and the gaming libraries are way more numerous than people doing CAD. CAD is quite a very niche subject. <laughs> and most CAD software were built in the 90s in C++, so you don't really have a huge community around that uh, online. But yet, exactly yet. But, but what I've seen, it's, it's also you know, that you, you get a lot of libraries that are open source and they work, but, you know, to some extent. Uh, it's, a, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, of course, you know, people are doing that on their free time. And they often, it's often very easy to start a project, much harder to finish it. So it's the last finishing touch sometimes that are not there. Let me give you an example, uh, text rendering. Uh, and if you're familiar with computer graphics, that's kind of the boss battle of computer graphics. <laughs> being able to render text very well. There is a bunch of crates trying to port stuff like half buzz or other shaping libraries into Rust, but it's not completely there yet. Uh, you would, in C++, you would just get that. And another example would be Boolean pass operation. So the ability to do intersection operation with pass made of cubic Bezier and line segment and arcs or even conics. Very hard problem. In my, I, in, to my knowledge, there is no Rust uh, creating Rust that does that uh, well. 
you only had them in C++. So that's kind of the example where it's a bit lacking uh, with you know the legacy language, I would say. Yeah, I think that makes sense. There's also a new company started, which is called KittyCAD, which I think is something similar for hardware design. So CAD is back in fashion in the 2020s, and we might get more Rust yeah. software for CAD. Brings like some of the things you mentioned bring me to a follow-up question I wanted to ask. Obviously, as we said, you know, open source sometimes has done the first 90% of a problem, hasn't done the second 90% of solving the same problem. And you fork and you write your own. Do you consider contributing back? Or do you consider open sourcing your own solutions? How does how do you navigate yeah. that question? So, so first of all, uh, I want to make clear that I absolutely love open source, and I think open source is like oh, no questioning, <laughs> amazing, uh, and it, and it got me into Rust. It got me so one of the goal at Trion is really to contribute back. So, uh, for example, those libraries I mentioned that are lacking, we definitely want to build them and open source them and just put them out there for free. Uh, it's just they take the time, and we're just you know very small right now. But that's definitely on the roadmap. We're definitely going to do that. And I think that's a way you enrich the ecosystem and make it better, better all along. I mean, it's also true that sometimes some components that you fork become so customized that it's really not useful for other people to use them. So it's on a case-by-case -case basis, I guess. Yeah, that that's very true. And that's something we see a lot in Rust. It's like, you know, some libraries that do have this constraint that they met, they're going to have nice ergonomics for their external users. If you build that into a product, you don't have that much constraint. So you can maybe make it more performant if you make a different trade-off. So for sure, that that's also an explanation why sometimes you need to fork the open source library to make it a bit more domain uh, adapted and a bit less uh, flexible, uh, especially in web. Uh, because one of our constraints is that we need to have a bundle size that is not huge. Uh, and a lot of Rust libraries they do compile to some quite large binaries, uh, especially due to monomorphization uh, of the generic types. So we try to not you know, use that too much and try to find other solutions. So you compromise dynamic dispatch at runtime in exchange for like smaller binary sizes. Okay. Same question this time for Jeremy. What's the... Apollo GraphQL approach to open source upstreaming contribution in general. I mean, that's where we're from. <laughs> we, we, Apollo started with an Apollo client and Apollo server. It was all in JavaScript. It used to be open source. That's the reason why we're here at first. If there wasn't open source, there would probably not be Apollo. That being said, we're operating under, uh, under slightly different constraints here. The first one is that the Apollo router is a library that is exposed in crates.io, which you can basically pull down and use. In order for a crate to be published to crates.io, it cannot have git dependencies. So we can't fork unless we publish the crates. So that leads to very interesting discussions and questions. One of them is, for example, if you have a specific use case in mind or something, you're like, huh, should I open a pull request upstream? Is that going to be accepted? Is that even something that people need? So uh, it really starts conversations around how much can I give back to the community and what are my constraints? What is my domain? Uh, is the feature that I'm trying to work on generic enough so that it works? Uh, another nice constraint that we have is that sometimes people's release cycles don't match ours. You have a bug fix, you have a patch, but it's going to take a while to actually deploy. And I say it as a, like, I maintain Bastion. It's probably something that hasn't had any, that hasn't had a lot of love in the recent month, if not years, because I just don't have the time to, to work on it as much as I wish I, I could. And it has constraint, like people have lives, they, they just have to, to deal with it. And that's kind of hard. So yeah, the, the, the trade-offs are here. The conversation are here. Uh, basically, anything that we can bring back, we do. Uh, you will see a lot of pull requests open. And most of, uh, most of the, the teammates are basically coming from open source. So we have a very strong open source culture. And then there's a the trade-off. Is that build versus buy? Is it something that we need to own so we can actually move it in the direction that we need to? Uh, in that case, well, we'll write a crate if we need to. But it's a lot of engineering time. Honestly, sometimes you just bite the bullet and that's it. No, that makes sense. 
Let's take some questions from the audience. So I have one from the slide and then I have one from the room. Let's start from the slider one. Everybody wants to know if you use GPU acceleration or web GPU. And then it's been asked three times. <laughs> so we don't we don't use web GPU because it's not well supported in half today. And so we just use plain old vanilla WebGL in the render engine. And we don't, you know, we we actually we've re we are in the midst of rewriting a new renderer, and it's still gonna be in WebGL. Uh, we I think we have to wait at least like probably one year, two years before we have enough browser support to make it viable in a product. So, but it's definitely there uh, on the roadmap, and I think we should see some gains from it. So we. We will definitely look into it. Like if you didn't have to support a wide range of browser compatibility, is that a target you use today? Do you think yes, it's not mature? Sure, okay. sure. Uh, because you know, one of the bottleneck that we have is tessellating some curves before we, we need to render them. And since we don't have compute, we cannot do a proper pipeline on the GPU. So we do it on the CPU. That's uh, a real you know, performance bottleneck. So moving that, being able to move some of the operation we do on CPU to the GPU, it will definitely be a net win. Um, so I'm really excited about WebGPU. I'm really excited about it. Uh, but when you have a production, uh, you know, commercial product, you need to support, you know, uh, the vast majority of browsers, uh, especially us because our clients, they're not tech savvy, you know, they're architects, they're people in real estate. They don't have the latest, you know, device, the latest browser, so we need to support quite. Uh, What's the oldest one. browser you support? Uh, yeah, so so I would say like modern browser. So we don't, you know, we don't support Internet Explorer. Everybody has yeah. a line; they don't want to cross. We support Safari, though, so it's uh, already a good effort. Cool. Let's take the question from the yeah. audience. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for this very informative uh, discussion. I I do have a question regarding the use of Rust for writing the rendering uh, software, especially in the browser. Raf, you, you brought up uh, Raf Levine about uh, his, his, his work on, on this. I guess Ross is, is very special for, for writing this kind of, of, of software. Uh, one route is using ECS and basically abstraction away using graphs and uh, all of that. You basically have vectors and then you index into them and it's, uh, it's fast. Uh, but it has some, uh, some issues when dealing with paths, for example. So there is uh, there is an issue there for uh, for using Rust. Uh, so what was your experience by using th this choice of Rust uh, for writing this kind of uh, this kind of software, especially that it's very hard to do <laughs> self differential uh, structs and other. So so I'm I'm very happy about it. I think if people are using Rust to do that, is because C plus plus was the language in which you would do it, and it's a system language. Rust was kind of thought to be able to replace some C++ and bring in safety to that. So, and, and also, also because Servo did a lot of work there and I think that drove a lot of people to it. But coming back to us, I'm, I'm really happy with, with this because if you look at rendering, I think ECS and rendering are two different problems because you the ECS is more like for the business logic of the engine. A rendering, it's basically about getting some primitive pass tags points and being able to translate that to some data on the GPU that can draw. Uh, you don't really need an ECS for that. Uh, what you need though is the ability to do very fast computation on specific small structure with a very good control of the layout in memory. Uh, that's very important uh, because you're going to have a lot loop where you're going to get a lot of data and you know cache miss are very cost costly. You need to be aware of that. Uh, you need to also be able to use the least amount of memory you can. So Rust gives you the ability to use a byte if you just need a byte, or to use an F64 if you need precision. That's super important. You don't get that very easily in JavaScript. So for those reasons, I think it's very nice. It works really, really well. And also for all the other reasons that it's very nice, because you get, uh, you know, if you look at rendering, it's quite complex. And the compiler, it's a huge help to not make too many bugs, too many mistakes. So for that, you know, you can come for the performance. And then, as Jeremy said, you stay because you have that safety and the ergonomics of the compiler. Thank so you. we talked about, you know, are we GUI yet? More than, more than a few. 
I have a different question, which this time goes on the other side, which is, are we web yet? So the question is, obviously Rust is suitable for high performance, you know, constraint, at scale, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, requirements, type of web services. But do you think it is a viable or recommended choice if you're doing a simple CRUD for your definition of simple CRUD? <laughs> I would very much love to have your answer on this because I ah, know okay. you have opinions on that. <laughs> that be, yeah, maybe next time. I think we are there, to be honest. A couple of years ago, I was not that confident. Sometimes because of... Look, I think the way async was introduced was great because it allowed for experimentation and all of that. But then it became something that we did not want it to become. And it was kind of hard to reason about the various crates in the ecosystem and kind of fights between those. Uh, it's something that I did not quite enjoy personally. Um, that being said, the state that it is at, uh, it's pretty standardized. It, uh, it relies on a couple of crates. Like everyone is relying on pretty much the same standards, which is great. It allows us to focus on the same things and improve the ecosystem. That's one thing that I really enjoy. And um, specifically for web stuff, like there, there's one example that we have in, in the router. So the router needs to support hot reload. What I mean by that is that while you are taking requests in, you need to be able to update your configuration, like update the whole stack, but not drop connections. You need to gracefully keep dealing with them while accepting new ones with the new configuration. This is the sort of things where you need like finer grain control over what is happening. And at that point, instead of using the axon primitives, you basically reach out to whatever is below, you bring it up and you write your loops yourself and you actually deal with it. So that's something that I really, really enjoy. I think we are web now. Uh, I think we could do better, especially for the ergonomics, because I don't have a PhD in math and warp was too hard for me, uh, for sure. Uh, but otherwise, I think it, uh, it is stable. It works really well. Still have some uh, HTTP2 uh, hiccups that I would like to deal with. But otherwise, it's, uh, it's honestly looking, looking good in general. The thing that we can work on is ergonomics, but I think you have a pretty good idea about that. <laughs> but it's not my panel, so we're it's not, not. going to talk about that. Uh, let's get that question. Uh, thanks. Um, software people of principles, and one we have is use the right tool for the right place. Rust has branded itself rightfully as a system programming language. So the web is not exactly the place where I would expect it to, to blossom. And I, I don't feel that I have heard much justification or sufficient justification of why using that there. I, I love the language. I try to apply this. I feel that most of the people repeat this principle ad nauseum, but never applies it. Use the right tool. No, actually, I'm going to use what is called for me. And this is what generally we do. Let's be honest. So do we have better justification in your cases? So I don't understand that if you have complex geometric operation, obviously you would need this. But AutoCAD is not running on the web. Trades Max is not running on the web. Why do you need your app to be run on the web? A business plan question. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's actually a, a very good question. And... It's kind of the whole premises on which Rayon is built, uh, which is that the problem with CAD software or legacy software that are desktop native apps is that it's very hard to share your work because people need to have the software installed. Uh, and if you look at architecture, for example, it's a very collaborative process. You have the client, you have the architect, you have the engineers, you have you know, the contractors, people that are going to build the stuff. They're often in different companies, so they're not going to have the same tool. So the fact that you can do it in the browser, uh, it's a huge gain because then you can just share a link and people can just open it and they all have a browser and uh, they can just access it. So it's kind of this paradigm 
Um, so that's why we think it's super important. Uh, but where you're absolutely right, it's if you look at it from the performance angle, it's much worse. Like it's way harder to do than do a native app. So we make that trade-off. We think, okay, of course the web was not made to do those kind of software, but the gain that we have by this kind of the browser is the OS paradigm is often for it's it's enough for us to say, okay, let's try to make this in the browser. Exactly like Figma did, exactly like Google Doc did. And we're seeing this more and more. Uh, but it's kind of a you know a trade-off you need to make. I actually have a follow-up question there. So obviously we've talked so far of using REST for doing well for targeting WASM, which then you're deploying in the browser. That doesn't necessarily confine you to the browser, does it? Like nothing prevents you from a technology stack in the future to also offer a native a native version of what you're already deploying towards Chromium and Firefox. Yeah, sure. And that was actually one of the the idea we also had by using Rust was to say, yeah, we probably for our super users, we're gonna de definitely build a native app at some point because it's more powerful. Uh, you're gonna have you can access more you know, features of the GPU, you can do way more stuff. Uh, and having the core engine built in Rust means you can reuse that. So it's very useful. And also one thing I didn't talk about is that we also use Rust on our backend. Uh, we built a multiplayer backend. And the very nice thing is that we can just reuse the code from the client to the backend. And if you have built, you know, engine for multiplayer in games, you know that, you know, you need to run a lot of the same stuff that you run the client in the backend. Uh, to check for invariants or stuff like that. And by using Rust, we can reuse that very well. But, you know, we could have done that with JavaScript as well, I mean, uh, in Node.js. But we get we get performance as well and all the advantages that you, you mentioned. Yeah, it's, it's the holy grail of the one stack. Which actually brings me to another question I wanted to ask you before. So we've said, okay, you're using Rust in the backend, you're using Rust in the front end for all the canvas rendering and so on and so forth. But you're also using TypeScript in the front end, are you not? Yeah, sure. And, and that also goes to, to your question. One thing I feel that Rust is not very good at is building UI. And something that is the web and the DOM and JavaScript is very good at is building UI. So the whole UI of Rayon is done in a very vanilla React TypeScript app. And only the core engine is in Rust. And to give you an idea, I actually looked at the number before coming. We have around, we're, we're just shy of around 200,000 lines of code in Rust. And we have a, a bit more in TypeScript. Uh, so it's like a half and half. So for sure, uh, I, and, I, and if we had to build the UI in Rust, and I know some companies have done that, even for the web, uh, that would have been extremely painful for sure. Uh, so I think that was the right trade-off. And also it's a very common strategy. Like I have seen it deployed in multiple companies, especially the ones that do native applications or like multi-platform applications to have their core business logic, the fat client, so to say, written in REST. And then, you know, they're doing Swift and then they're doing Kotlin and then they're doing TypeScript, depending on what they're targeting. So that is definitely a pattern that is seeing more and more adoption and quite successfully, to be fair, at least from the people I've spoken to. So different question that was coming from the audience. But once again, speaking of rendering engines, how are you doing the multiplayer part? So <laughs> it's, it will be a long talk to describe, but short uh, abstract. Yeah. So so if you want to go in detail, so so basically we use a system that is very similar to Git. So, and maybe you're familiar with a company called uh, Rossicorp. Uh, they do something called Repiclash. I mention it because they wrote a very nice paper illustrating their strategy, and it's very similar to ours. So if you want to look it up, they're, very, they're much better than us at that, uh, but we, we build our own. So yeah, basically the idea is that you have a state that you can diff very easily. And this is where ECS actually it's very nice because for those that don't know ECS, it's a very simple idea where you just have entities and a bunch of components. So it's a very flat structure. So it's very easy to know what has changed. You look at each component and you can have a new value. So we can diff the state very easily and then we send all those diffs to a backend and the backend is like the 
uh, you know, central authorities that decide, okay, this is uh, the value. And then the problem becomes, how do I eventually converge on all the clients to that same state that is on the back end? So this is where you, you need to rebase, you need to do stuff that is, you know, precise, especially when you put it, the end do redo mechanism on top of it. Uh, but that's the core of being a multiplayer engine. Which is also fun, or it sounds fun, a particular type of fun. Now, obviously, we've talked at length, and you know, Rust at Apollo, Rust at Rayon, but in a way, and this is true what he was saying before, like developers sometimes like their tools, and so they follow the tool, and then the tool determines the problem. And so I'm aware of several people who are trying to break into the industry using Rust as their main programming language. So in a certain way, you are living the dream, so to say, of this audience, because they're working with Rust full time. And so the question I ask you as the IT managers, or in any way, people who are building teams that you Rust, and so interview and look at profiles, what do you what suggestions do you have for folks that are looking for rust jobs and what do you look like what do you look for in a profile for those positions okay so that's a that's a very good question it's because it's true that it's it can be quite hard to have some experience in rust uh, professional experience so what i would recommend and this is something we always look for is to just build your own project uh, so it's quite hard to do because you need time for that so you have a job how can you do it so the two ways we, we have done it is first people that have built their own open source project in Rust. Obviously that's the best, I think, stuff to do because you learn the language and you can show off your work. We can look at your code. So that way you get, you know, pass the screening immediately. And the other thing that we've done is people that were actually, that haven't done no Rust whatsoever, um, but they are very strong in another language, sometimes for example, C++ or uh, TypeScript. And then we, we, we make them come on board in a role where they can do a bit of both. Um, so in our case, since we have half the code in TypeScript, we had some engineers that actually started with the TypeScript stuff and gradually worked on the Rust side. And now they can do both, which is very valuable to us. And for C++, my experience was that people very strong in C++ can learn Rust very fast. So that was not a huge problem. And we had oh, people like that. Uh, come on board. What about you, Jeremy? I'm going to say a uh, half lie. Half lie because open source is pretty much the reason why I landed a job using Rust. Back then, I had a choice between learning Go and learning Rust, and I kind of enjoyed talking to Rust people. So I started doing Rust, and one thing led to another, and it landed me a couple of jobs. So that's awesome. That being said, I know that Apollo, for example, when we hire, we are looking for people who can actually understand the product and can actually talk to other and get a broader understanding. Rust, we can teach. That's no problem. There was this, I don't know when it was released, but you know the, the Google material that helped. Comprehensive them. Rust. Exactly. Yes. There's a lot of, there's a lot of high quality resources on how to learn Rust. We can certainly teach Rust to people. And the best thing is that if it's wrong, it's not going to compile. I am. I feel really great having junior engineer pushing stuff into production in Rust. No problem. So that's probably not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who are able to ask the right questions, talk to the right people, understand what kind of ecosystem they're working within. And yeah, teaching, yeah, you just... Put them in a team with great engineers who want to share knowledge. Kind of works. Yeah, I guess you made two good points there, right? First one is that a person that doesn't know how to use Rust, worst case scenario is ineffective. It's usually not dangerous, which yeah. is not necessarily <laughs> true for all languages. You can tell a lot of stories about Python. The second, though, is interesting because obviously you say Rust we can teach. But I also know the folks that work at Apollo GraphQL, you have a stellar Rust team. So you're starting from an extremely strong, like, well of Rust expertise. I, I also would say Rust we can teach, you know, if I had that lineup in my, <laughs> my backend team. So true, but I would caveat that it depends on the company you're applying for. 
I'll add my answer to this question as well, for previous experience having hired a lot of Rust developers. And it goes back to what Bastien was saying. You have two, usually two skill sets. The one is the domain knowledge, and the other one is the technology knowledge. And as long as one of the two is present, the other one can be filled. So, you know, if you are strong in the domain, then you can be taught Rust. If you're strong in Rust, you can be taught the domain. If either of them are not there, then it's very difficult to get started. Is the pizza arrived? Just, I have no idea how concept of time. I can keep asking questions for like a long time. Wait, it. I don't see it, but I think just go on for a bit. Okay, longer. so one question from you in the front. Mark is away, so keep my micro. Thank you. Have you have like have you have to like convince other people to like use Rust? To me, like a married this, but once you start using it in your personal project, it's kind of like obvious. But it's hard to convince some people, the team sometimes. And my solution was to change my job like half a year ago. <laughs> like, what was your experience? If you can't bring Rust to them, you go to Rust. That's a good strategy. But let's see other answers. So, so I'm not sure I have an answer because since we were using Rust from the get go, but we do have some engineers that only do TypeScripts and don't really learn Rust. I think mostly because they don't have the time. Uh, I've not met people that were like, no, not interested, uh, don't want to learn it. Uh, especially from people that only know JavaScript and TypeScript, I feel it's such a complementary, like additional language to have in your tool set that is so different from JavaScript. And I would definitely recommend to, to, to look at it. So no, I didn't have that kind of uh, problem. I had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I had to dial it down a little bit because I was just so in love with the language that I couldn't stop talking about it. And I became a bit, not aggressive, but a bit boring to others, I guess. The strike force is, is here. I think there are two things to acknowledge. One, one of them that I spoke of before, which is when you're at work, you're here to deliver stuff. You're here to add features, fix bugs. And Rewriting everything in another language because you think it's cool is probably not the best move, right? Even use the right tool for your job, honestly. That's it. Like, you are shipping stuff in Python or JavaScript. The whole company knows how to use it. Should we switch because the language is more appealing or a bit faster? Probably not. That's not where the value is. Doesn't prevent you from having site projects or doing a bunch of cool stuff and socializing it, like uh, going to meetups and everything. Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it means changing job. And to that extent, um, there's like the ecosystem is like the the industry is pretty interesting because on one hand you have people who are excited about Rust who are willing to find positions that use Rust, and on the other hand you have companies that say I can't hire anyone who does Rust. What is happening? And now there's this like this 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 really weird spot, and I think it comes from having strong senior engineers who joined these companies or even consultancies that help them with a boilerplate, like we are gonna help you set up your projects correctly in order to use Rust. And we are gonna teach everyone and infuse the knowledge for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, so that then you have the stable basis, you've picked the, li uh, the right libraries, you've picked the right ecosystem, and you have the right knowledge to be successful. Once they have that, they will probably be in a better position to hire more junior engineers or do more with that. But we need to help them bootstrap it. And I mean, by we, I don't mean we as engineers, but we are as business people or consultants. That's what we are here for. People want to, we just need the, to give them the, 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 the push and help them start it. This is what I call the Rust cold start problem. Where like people are like, <laughs> I wanna get started. And well, we don't have any Rust experts and we don't know where to find them. It's like, that can be solved. And yes, yeah. you can also talk to me for what Jeremy was saying before. Said that, I think we have a question from the far back. Yes, hello everyone. Hey. So we speak a lot about back and front, but I've seen that Jeremy, you've been working a few years ago with the REST on embedded systems. So I would like to have your feedback. I, I know REST, it's a long time, you know, three years with the REST, but I would like to know what, what, what is your feedback. I don't know if other people here are using REST on an embedded system, but I think it's a huge thing now at the moment. Wow, that's a good question. That's one that um, I unfortunately don't have 
enough knowledge to answer. I did work on embedded systems. I worked on the e-bikes, which was extremely fun. So protocols that were close to what you get in the automotive industry, for example, uh, that's really great. I see strong signals of people who really want to invest time and, en and energy to actually use uh, Rust in general. I see a lot of value here. By that, I mean the guarantees that you would get from the language are pretty good. With that being said, for safety critical systems, the language, the whole language is not certified and we don't have the, the, the full history as much as a C or ADA. Is it ADA, ADA? Uh, so it, it's, it's such a situation. It's slowly gaining traction in non-critical systems and in embedded systems, it really shines. There's like no stood. You can use it in pretty much anything. There are, like, it has a super low footprint. The binary is a bit big, but it has a super low footprint at, at runtime. And even, like, you can strip the binary. There's a lot you can do. So I, I'm very optimistic, and I don't know if you follow or see what Ferris systems have done recently with Ferrocene, among other things. We are getting there. There's parts of Rust that are being... How do you say it? Certified. Certified, yeah, really. That's it. There are yeah. part of us that are being certified. They are not yet certified to actually create, to build spaceships and rockets with it just yet. Uh, but uh, we are slowly starting it, starting to see it gain traction. And even uh, I saw a blog post a couple of weeks ago from Volvo who start using it in their, well, in their systems, but also in their embedded systems, for example. So just takes a lot of time, I guess, to, to actually get the traction, but certainly a space I would watch for. Yeah. I mean, we're not in outer space yet, but we're getting into automotive. So Volvo is an example. Renault published a paper quite recently in the same direction. I know of experiments at other places that probably haven't written about that publicly, so I'm not going to mention them. But yes, getting ferrozine out and so getting a tool chain that is certified for a certain level of usage is at least making a lot of conversations happen. Then we'll see in the next, I think, 12 to 18 months what those conversations actually become. There was one question there. Hi. On REST, we have a rather large code base, and so obviously we have compile time issues. Uh, we have, yeah, so we have two main solutions uh, for that. The first one is to reduce genericity. Uh, it has a quite big fallback. So the way we do it is we do a non-generic inner function. You have a generic stuff. You do your generosity and non-generic, like this only this thing. This comes with a lot of boilerplate. I don't know if you have a solution to reduce this boilerplate. The other solution that we have is to split code into multiple crates, which enables more parallelization and compilation time. This has another fallback, which is uh, you don't get warnings about unused code anymore because you have to put public your structures and functions. Do you have a solution to that? And do you have a third idea on how to optimize compile time? <laughs> That's a really good question. The snarky answer would be, I would wait for faster than Lime's next blog post. <laughs> He'll probably figure it out. I think we read the same one about genericity and uh, the inner function, which is actually a good idea. One thing that we started doing at Apollo at first was to avoid derives that we wouldn't need. For example, you know, you use like derive debug because sometimes why not derive clone because why not as well. And then you end up like expanding, generating a lot of code. That being said, what we, what we try to focus on at the moment is more aggressive caching and reusing of whatever has been compiled before. I'm talking about circle CI artifacts. I'm talking about SC cache, for example, uh, and and Cargo Chef, but I think someone else is able to talk about, about it. About that, as well. yes. <laughs> so yeah, reuse uh, reuse as much as you can. Unfortunately, it's a pain. The first thing that I wanted to say about reducing boilerplate would be macros. But if you had macros, then you're in an even worse spot because, and even if, like if it's proc macros, then you need to recompile it every time a user changes their code. So. Might as well want to avoid that. I unfortunately don't have 
a really relevant solution for that. That's one of my pain points as well. Anyone else? No, oh, I don't have a solution. I can give you <laughs> I can give you uh, some pointers and based on like we've done this on some good basis. Like step one is breaking it down into crates. Um, the issue with that is, as you mentioned, you don't get any code and use warnings. There are some things that can help with that. So some of the tooling that you mentioned at the beginning around code coverage, you can use that to an extent also to look at lines that are never exercised and then can be a way to recover some of that. The other thing you can act on obviously is aggressive caching at everywhere in every place, whatever you can cache, cache. The other is throwing more compute at the problem, especially in CI and also in laptops. Uh, it's true that ARM laptops are much faster at compiling REST than x86-64 laptops, and this is just a fact. So any M1, M2 is going to have a much better developer productivity that you get on any other kind of laptop. And the third lever you can use uh, is linking. So trying to understand what linker are you using and also how you're structuring your tests and if that is generating a necessary linker load. But we can go into details. You grab me afterwards and this is one of my favorite topics, which is why I'm switching from questioner to answerer. <laughs> Just on the derives, do you have a um, tool to detect and use derives? Not aware of that existing. That's a good idea for a weekend project. <laughs> it's a few weekends projects, probably. Yeah, maybe a few weekends. I mean, depends on what how much compiler Rust compiler contributions you've done in the past. But, I, have, know, I don't want to put a ceiling on that. I have tens of domain names I've never used. So, what's one more? <laughs> keep the economy going. Yep. <laughs> um, so I think we are nearing the end. I saw some some pizzas in the in the background. So I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we're going to wrap it up. So we spoke about business. We spoke about REST usage of your respecting companies. We drove that and a bunch of other you know, very serious people questions that I've been asking for 30 minutes plus. The question I'd like to close this kind of panels with is, let's forget about all that. So let's assume you have an amount of unbounded free time that you can spend, and you can work on any project you like, which might be programming related or not. What would you be doing? Wow, that's a tough question. Uh, so I have children, uh, so that okay. would be probably my, my, my project, I would say. Uh, no, and, and coming back to technology, one of the cool things I always wanted to do was kind of build stuff, and I you know, dabble very far back, building stuff with you know, uh, electronics and Arduino and stuff like that. So probably that, I would, would want to do some stuff like that and you know, use Rust on in rockets or uh, yeah building a robot with my kids that would be a nice thing well i don't have kids <laughs> so i do have a bit of time that's also a good project making kids so you have a home lab <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly yeah i could do that uh, no i think i would probably teach teach others i used to joke that i did rust because i was not smart enough to do c plus plus I think I think it can be taught. I think it's great. And there's a lot of people that supported me uh, when I started doing open source and all of that. Uh, if I could give back some of that by spending time with people trying to help them understand and learn that, I'm much more interested in the human aspect of the Rust ecosystem than, than the actual code. So yeah, that's probably what I would do. And you have my credentials. If you want to reach out, DM me if you have any ideas, questions around mentoring or whatever, just hit me up. Sounds good. Well, that was a wrap. Give them a show of hands. They've been here for a long time. Okay.